Kia No mai haere mai ki te papatonga reiwa, ki runga o rongo marairua, ki raro e te tuanui o tō tātou whare i te hono ki Hawaiki, ko Poppy Aho. Welcome to this evening's discovery discussion. Um, and before I introduce our wonderful speaker, I have a couple of health and safety notes. The Faripaku are located around the corner to your left, and in the unlikely event of an emergency, please follow the directions of one of our hosts. Uh, so now I'm delighted to introduce you to Mornay, aka Man Lambo, who is a software engineer with a passion for fossils. He uses a combination of technology and field work to showcase New Zealand's amazing fossil record. As Man Lambo fossils, he shares weekly videos via social media to his million plus followers, videos which have garnered over 200 million views. Tonight, Mornay will illustrate how amateur fossil finders can impact how we understand New Zealand's past. Thank you for joining us. I will now pass you over to Mornay. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? It's so awesome to be talking to you all about fossils. So as you can see, I've got some fossils here on the front of the, the a table over here. Afterwards, you can come have a closer look. So as you can see, my name is Mornay, and I find fossils and I prepare them. So I'm a software engineer by day, and then weekends, as soon as five o'clock on a Friday comes, sometimes a little bit earlier, I'm out, I'm looking for fossils, normally on a Saturday or a Sunday, over in North Canterbury, about half an hour north of Christchurch. And as uh, you know, Poppy said, I document them, I share them on YouTube, I share them on TikTok and Instagram. So you might be asking, what's fossil prepping? I've got a video over here, which should play. If we set it up, well, there we go. So here I'm on the beach in North Canterbury, in a place called Martinau, and I've just found a rock, and this rock's got a few bits of exposed bone. And what you're seeing over here, this took five months of work. So I'm gonna show you in about a minute over here. What I'm doing over there is I'm using an air scribe uh, acid, which is only just vinegar, to remove the rock carefully from this fossil penguin over here. Uh, this fossil penguin is about four million years old, and it's over here on the front of the table. So afterwards, you can come have a look at it. But this is the tiny little fossil penguin that I found. So there it is. It kind of looks like one of those chickens you buy in the supermarket. And what's really cool about this fossil penguin is it's articulated. So articulated means that all the bones are where they would have been when this animal was alive. Normally that tells you that probably it was buried quite quickly because what happens with something that falls to the bottom of the ocean? Things try and eat it. That's the tail down there, the little tail. <laughs> um, unfortunately, so if you look at it carefully, what's one thing that's missing over here? Skull, I heard it over there. So unfortunately the skull's not there, but the one very important bone is the ankle bone. So these are the long leg bones over here and the ankle bone's missing, but luckily it fell and it just got stuck at the back over there. Fellows managed to uh, excavate it from there. That should be just about done with the video. Let's move on to the next one. So that's fossil prepping, but as you can tell by my accent, I'm not from New Zealand. So where am I from? From a very uh, confusingly named town called East London in South Africa, <laughs> uh, which is on the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Our claim to fame is the coelacanth over here. Wait, I've got a laser pointer. Here we go. Has anyone ever heard of the coelacanth? Yeah, there we go. A few people have heard of the coelacanth. We also had these 124,000 year old footprints. If you look at those human footprints over there, and then you can see over there some bird footprints as well. And I didn't really know about this until I was about 10 or 12 years old, but we used to go cliff diving at this place. Didn't realize how significant it was. But the coelacanth is quite weird because it disappeared from the fossil record with the dinosaurs. So they thought this fish over here went extinct. It's kind of like walking to your limb. Dinosaur just poking its head out of there. They thought it had been extinct. And what's really cool about the coelacanth, well, fish, is this is the, the fish family tree over here. Here's modern fish over there. 
This is tetrapods, so things with four limbs like us, humans. And the coelacanth is closer related to humans than it is to other modern fish. It's a very strange creature and something quite special to find on the dock when you're not expecting it over there. And where did it begin for me in New Zealand? So this is my first ever fossil I found. Does anyone recognize what it is? Vertebrae, vertebrae yeah. So a vertebrae from a, a dolphin, I think, Felix might recognize. Yes, he's saying yes. Felix is the cetacean expert. He'll recognize that. So that's a tiny little dolphin vertebrae I found. Uh, myself and my partner went out to this beach over here, Motnau Beach, beautiful beach. We were just around that bend over there looking at the island, and I saw this pebble that looked a little bit different to all the other pebbles. And what I then did is I went, of course, to Google, and I Googled Motonao fossils, and up popped Motonao crab fossils. I was like, wait a minute, crab fossils? That sounds pretty cool. I need to go find some crab fossils. So, of course, the next weekend I was there looking for crab fossils. Uh, this is the search results now. So if you look over here, I searched for Motonao fossil, and what's weird now is now my videos are popping up. So it's, <laughs> that's quite strange. <laughs> Um, and for three, I think I went three weekends, didn't find a thing. I was looking probably at the wrong rocks, but I picked every rock up, looked at it, didn't look like a crab, put it back, until finally one day found quite a special looking rock over there. And you can see, if you look carefully, there's a claw sticking out there, there's a claw sticking out there. That's the bottom, so there's the claw again, there's the claw. And that crab over there is inside a concretion, which is just a really hard rock. And what I did is I found this crab, and I realized I want to see what the crab actually looks like. So I went off to uh, Mitre 10, got this little uh, engraver there. It was, uh, it was cheaper than $53, I think it was $30 when I bought it. And then I spent about, uh, two or three weekends, removing as much rock as I could. Because what you have to do, you can't just use a rotary uh, dremel, you have to use one that's an engraver where it's actually uh, slowly chipping away at the rock. And that, what I di then did is for the next crab that I did, I actually had to buy two of these because one kept overheating. So I had one cooling down while I was prepping the other one. So I'm like, oh, this is a little bit slow, and these are electric ones, so I went and got a pneumatic one. So this is an air-powered one over there. I went to Amazon, I just typed in pneumatic engraver. I popped this one, so I got it for, I think it was about $200, which is not a lot when you look at what the, the professional series are. And what I did is I made a little time-lapse of it, popped it on YouTube to show my friends back home what I did, and it went kind of viral, you know, got about 200,000 views. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, so what I did is I did another one, and that got about two million views. I'm like, hey, this is easy. Uh, and the next video got like 200 views. So <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't figure out the, the algorithm that first time, but it was great fun. And uh, you might have seen uh, some things happen on the screen over here. I think it just needs focus on that one. There we go. So now if you want to go see any of these videos of these fossils being prepped, you can go to my YouTube channel, and it's grown from, so I've been doing this for about four or five years now, so it's grown to about 500,000 subscribers on that one, about the same on TikTok, and it's been so much fun doing this and sharing this with people. And if you look at this video over here, which is the penguin prep, actually, the one I showed you earlier, 108 million views. So 108 million times that has been watched. Uh, probably not by 108 different people, 108 million different people, but you know, a few million people have watched that. So, uh, when I was looking for these crab fossils, I found a really big rock. And I could see on the edges, there were some crab legs sticking out. So what happens is, uh, these crabs, they died, and then they formed in these concretions, but the concretions didn't enclose all the legs. So when they come out of the cliff, these legs stay behind in the cliff. So you kind of see these little cross sections of the legs. And I found this really big one, but I knew I wasn't good enough yet, so I waited two years until I finished, or until I thought I was getting a little bit better. And then I started prepping it. So here's a time lapse of 200 hours of me prepping 
that really big crab over there. Much to the delight of my neighbors. <laughs> uh, you can see there's the big claw. So these, claw, uh, these crabs have got a big right hand claw. So you'll see over here when you come up afterwards and have a look, the right hand claw is a lot bigger than the left hand claw. And I think that's in the males. So they've got a, uh, they've got a feeding claw. Oh, sorry, that's me. They've got a feeding claw, and then they've got the bigger claw over there on the right-hand side. There we go. And you can see it started off at 16.4 kilograms and ended at 7 kilograms. So, yeah, that's a, that's a fair amount of rock. Oh, no, what did it say? 16.4, I think I removed. It started at 23 kilograms. What I do then is you'll notice that there's another crab in front here. You see this crab over here? This is exactly the same crab over here, except this is 3D printed. So that's, that's not a real fossil. That's a 3D printed one, because what I do when I finish prepping a fossil is I go put them on Sketchfab. Has anyone here heard of Sketchfab? Yes, yeah, so I put them on Sketchfab as a 3D model. So anyone, anywhere in the world can print them and have their own fossil. And I think Stuart and Caroline over here printed it. Yeah, and painted it. It looked amazing. So once you paint it, it looks really cool. It looks like your own version of the fossil crab, like this one. And you can just use acrylic paint. It's pretty cool. So I've printed myself some megalodon teeth from uh, New York and all sorts of things. Uh, so it's a tumidocarcin, this giganteous crab. It's about 10 to 14 million years old. So it looks pretty good for something that old. You can even see the little bits of um, this markings. If you look closely on the legs here, you can still see the markings on there. They're extinct, so you won't find this crab anymore. And they were deep water crabs. So where this crab used to live was maybe two, 300 meters deep. And yeah, about 95% of the crabs I find is that species over there. Here's another fossil I found. It's also on the front over here. This is my first fossil that was actually written up in a scientific publication. Alan was one of the authors over there. Let me just see. I don't think I'm going to get it out there, but there it is. I don't know if you can see. You'll have to come watch or look afterwards, but that's a really big shark tooth. Well, for me, anyway. I don't find big shark teeth like megalodon teeth, but that's a really big shark tooth, and that's a new shark species for New Zealand. So there it is over there still stuck in the rock, so I had to prep this out of the rock. And what's cool about this one, there it is, after it was removed. So a great white shark's got lots of serrations. Uh, the Hastala shark has got uh, none, so very smooth sides, and this one is kind of in between, so it's a transitional shark tooth, and there's the paper that it was published in. So I was very excited when this was published, I think late last year, yeah, October last year. So that's my first published uh, fossil over there. Then who can tell me what that fossil looks like over there? This is how I found it on the beach. So the day I found this, I probably walked five kilometers uh, from the car to the furthest point, turned around, came back, so a 10 kilometer day. I found this right in front of my car. <laughs> so, so I'd walked over this in the morning gone looking everywhere, didn't find much, came back and I saw this little piece of bone sticking out over there. Don't know if you can see that, can you see that? It's a little piece of bone. I know it's bone because it's got that cancerous tissue, the, the honeycombing that a bone has that's sticking out over there. So who wants to take a guess? What is that? If you haven't seen the video. Yeah, over there. Say again? A turtle? A vertebrate. This isn't the vertebrate, but good guess. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, it's a turtle skull. So let's have a look. <laughs> okay, there I am pointing it out. And this was a real big surprise for me because when I found it, I did think it was a vertebra. It's got that vertebra shape to it. Here's a vertebra over here. So I kind of thought it was this shape. It looked kind of the rough, right size for maybe a whale. But then when I started prepping it, the, it looked very fibrous. It looked weird, the, the texture of it. So, I think, so I've got different size air scribes, in, if you see there on the video over there. Got the really tiny ones there I'm putting it in vinegar. I should probably wear gloves, but it's just vinegar. <laughs> um, and then I'm using 
some very large ones, some very small ones. Every now and again, while you're prepping the fossil, you find other fossils inside that concretion, so you have to keep those separate because you could actually use those to date them, like I am over there. That's a little shell. Sometimes you can use those shells to get a better date of it. So it's starting to take shape. There's the nose. That's the nose hole there in the front. This also took about five months. So it's, uh, it's about 100 hours with the air scribe and I think 30 or 40 um, cycles with the acid, the vinegar. So what you do is you put it in vinegar for maybe three, four hours, then you put it in fresh water for three times that amount, so like 12 hours. And then you have to, to, to cover the exposed bone with like a plastic solution so the acid can't get to it. And then you just repeat that process over and over until all the rock's gone. So this is before the acid prep, so I've removed as much rock as I can. And the reason for this is because you don't want to scrape away at the bone with your air scribe because it's a tungsten carbide stylus. It will just, you know, leave marks on the bone. There we go. It looks a lot quicker on, the, on these ones. So it's a large turtle skull between three and six million years old. The shell, so the carapace, or no, the, the shell of the turtle would have been about a meter. And I know that by, I sent the measurements of the skull to the uh, NOAH in America. So I forget what that's called, but that's one of their government institutions. And they could take it into their collection. And they found a turtle with the same size skull. And they said it's about a, a meter long. Yeah, it took about five months. Uh, I'm still not finished prepping it. So it turns out to identify a turtle, you need to look at the palette. And you can see there's a lot more rock underneath the palette over there. But I wasn't finished with this fossil. So you can see over here, <laughs> this is at the hospital. I just put it through the CT, CT scanner. So the CT scan is like a fancy x-ray. Instead of just giving you a two-dimensional uh, picture at the end, it gives you a three-dimensional picture, which you can then either share with other people, other researchers, or you can 3D print it. So here's that turtle skull, but it's a 3D print so we can see the interior bones, the bone structure inside there. And what's even cooler, so here's the original. Here's that turtle skull. Very weird looking thing, it kind of looks at you. And that's a rock I still need to remove at the bottom there. And then this is the interior structure. So I thought that's where the brain goes. But that's not the brain, that's the muscles for chomping. The brain is actually that tiny little hole inside there. So the, yeah, it didn't do much except bite, I think. And what's really cool is you can get the, the cast of the brain from the CT scan. So if you want to go have a look at this in closer detail, you can go to um, Sketchfab and just go have a look at it over there. There's me 3D printing it. And what's even cooler about this one is, I don't know if you noticed that, there's a big triangular hole there where something bit it. So something took a bite out of this turtle. Would have been something pretty big to try and bite the turtle that size. Okay, so what I've been talking about now is this is the geological time scale. And there's the meteorite caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. So that's where the dinosaurs kind of stopped living. And the fossils that I've been talking about are kind of in this area over here, so the younger fossils. So I'm gonna show you one of the older fossils I found. Um, where I'm in North Canterbury, the fossils are maybe from Miocene. Uh, there's some younger ones, Holocene ones, so from 100,000 years to about 12 million years, most of the fossils on this table is where I found them. Uh, I'm gonna show you one now from the Cretaceous, which is over there, so about 75, 80 million years old. Okay, who can tell me what that is sticking out there? So I'll show you what I saw when I found it on the, in the river. So this was in the river after a flood. And you can see there's a little bit of bone sticking out there. And there was a tiny bit of bone sticking out there. Yes, plesiosaur, yeah, yeah, you've got it right there. So this is a plesiosaur vertebra that I found. And I could tell, you can kind of see the round angle over there. And I could tell from that it was probably a vertebra. So there I am helpfully pointing it out. <laughs> uh, if you miss anything in these videos, they are on my YouTube channel, so you can 
have a look at them. Uh, you can see me, I put a pool noodle over that one air scrub because it was shaking a bit too much. And pool noodles are used for anything. <laughs> There it is in the vinegar, and for some reason, this concretion over here reacted very well with the vinegar. Some are slow, some are fast. This was a much faster one. So it was really, you can see all the bubbles appearing there. It's nice and fizzy. You want it to be fizzy, because then it's taking a lot more rock away from that. Here I am coming in with the air scrub. So what I do with the air scrub, I remove the rock until there's only about a millimeter of rock on top of the bone. Uh, sometimes I'm bringing angle grinder in apparently. <laughs> um, and then when I've got that millimeter of rock, I put it in the vinegar and it takes it away and you get a really nice bone surface. So have, afterwards come have a look over here, but you will see there's a really beautiful bone surface. You can see all the little cracks and all sorts of things in this plesiosaur vertebra. And this is one of 42 vertebra, 42 or 44? It might even change between plesiosaurs, but this was the elasmosaur, so one of those ones with a really long neck. I'll show you a photo just after this. And it had 42 of these, or 44, don't quote me exactly on that, but it had around about 40 of these vertebrae uh, in its neck. So these are the most common fossils you'll probably find other than uh, the little paddle bones, which look like an hourglass. And there we go. I think this was only three months of work, so it wasn't too much work, this one. So plesiosaurs, uh, if, you th if you think of the Loch Ness Monster, that's kind of the picture they always use, the plesiosaur. There it is at the end, and you can see those beautiful cracks in the front there. Those aren't caused by the air scribe, that's just how it fossilized. And there's some of my other fossils over there. Uh, this isn't the exact plesiosaur species, this is just from my uh, fossil cards, which I'll talk about later. But some of these plesiosaurs were pretty big, seven meters. 1,500 kilograms, uh, don't worry about the rarity and the danger, but yeah, that's kind of the, the shape of them over there. Got those distinctive paddles, four paddles, and this really long neck, and some really cool teeth as well. Joan Whiffen found a really nice one, a really nice um, skull, plesiosaur skull. Okay, now I've talked a lot about fossil prepping. I'm sure you understand now what I mean when I say fossil prepping. And the one of the coolest things I get to do as you know, someone that shares, does a bit of science communication is I get to go to schools, I get to go talk at geology clubs, I get to talk to people like you about fossils. And it's amazing being able to go to a school in North Canterbury and taking these fossils along and showing them that this was found within half an hour of where you are now. Uh, these animals used to swim over your school basically when it was underwater. Uh, so it's a, it's a really, really, I think important thing to do to show, you know, New Zealand's got its own unique fossils. It's not just America and the States with their dinosaurs. Um, but yeah, even New Zealand's got some really cool and unique fossils, as you can just see, just from, you know, a small sample of what I found. One thing I realized is when you go to these school visits, is there's not much New Zealand material you can take along to leave with them. There's no games, there's no uh, there's not a lot of literature or uh, anything aimed at, call it six to ten year olds. So what I've done is I've made a little fossil game, and I'm just looking at the numbers here. I think I've got enough for everyone. So before you leave, I've got some fossil games down here, these fossil cards. And what I've done is I've created 30 different uh, fossils. So if you ever played Top Trumps as a kid, this is uh, like Top Trumps. And this is just an awesome way for them to learn about New Zealand fossils, get some stats in them. Uh, a lot of the, the artwork, you can see, uh, where's my pointer? So there's Kumimano, the really big penguin. I think, Alan, you, you were author on that paper. So this is the really big penguin. You can see, look at the weight of that penguin, 165 kilograms. It's a real heavy weight. 59 million years old, that's really old. That's pretty much almost at the dinosaurs, if you think about it. Um, yeah, so this is one of the, the, the more fun things I can do, you know, as my science communication is hand out these cards. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about ethics in fossil collecting. So fossil collecting is awesome. It's such a good, fun family activity. I do it, you know, with my family. Uh, I do it with other families. <laughs> um, you know, I do it most weekends. It's, it's such a rewarding, uh, awesome way to learn about nature, to get out there, to put some kilometers in, rather than going to the pub. You can go for a walk on the beach. And, you know, as a bonus, you can find cool 
fossils like this crab over here. There's one, this is prep on both sides. So there's the front and there's the back. And it's just a really good way of getting in touch with nature. But unfortunately, there's the, the other side of it. Um, sometimes when you've got a, a little fossil hammer in your hand, you get to a fossil like this, and this is a plesiosaur fossil. This is about 1.5 tons over here. It's a very complete fossil, and it's articulated. So as I said earlier, that means the bones are in position, which is really rare. Unfortunately, someone's knocked that block off there. So, you know, it probably had a crack in there, and they're like, oh, I wonder what's inside there. Put a chisel in there, just broke it open, and you can see there's a bit of damage to it, which is really a shame because these are rare things. They're not, it's not common for a plesiosaur to fossilize. Um, luckily, we saw this, so we, we retrieved this, and we also we were able to retrieve this block over here. But what often happens is someone will find a little cool bone on the edge, knock it away, and then um, that bone will be lost to science. And as luck will have it, that's probably the one bone someone no, needs to identify this, this fossil. So you can see over here, that's a row of bones over there. Also 85 million year old bones, plesiosaur, a really big one. Either plesiosaur or mosasaur, not too sure, but this is where it's been broken. So I always encourage people, if you can't take it away, you know, leave it there for the next person to have a look at. It's awesome to be able to go down to a river and see a plesiosaur skeleton right there. Luckily, we were able to go and fish this, I think, the next week. So this was on private land, actually. And the farmer had some forestry equipment there, and it lifted that 1.5 ton rock up so easily. Um, it's sitting at the farmer's, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so a large part of what I do is I carry big rocks around. <laughs> Lift with your legs. <laughs> Yeah, so I had to carry that back to the car uh, in case a flood comes. But there's the, there's the original block now. Uh, you can see that forestry equipment had no problem lifting that up. But that's the actual bone we were worried about. That's a really nice, I think that's one of the paddle bones higher up into the, the paddle. So that's a beautiful one over there. And because so little is known of New Zealand fossils of that age, pretty much every fossil is significant. It's not like this is art. Oh, it's just a you know a common fossil like ammonite, where you can just knock it with a hammer and see if it opens up. But I had a great chat with Nick, Dr. Nick Rollins. So if you want to learn more about ethical fossil collecting, there's a video over there on my YouTube channel. And the thing we don't want to do, or you know, no one wants to do, is discourage people from fossil hunting. Fossil hunting is such an awesome thing. And it's such a great family activity. And most of the fossils are found by amateurs. So the other two penguins from this locality, where this one's from, so where this one's from, not sure of the species yet, but the other two that are known from this area, they were found by an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. And they were named after them. So they, it's really important to be out there looking for fossils and you know, a lot of fossils are found by people younger than 10 because they're closer to ground, they've got sharper eyes, they've got long school holidays, they can be out there. <laughs> yeah, so in New Zealand, we're quite lucky. There aren't many laws covering fossil collecting, so you can go down to the beach, you can take a fossil home, but that's a really great privilege. So part of that, what I do is when I find something cool, I email the museum and they always really good at getting back to me. Um, so if you find anything that looks like it could be significant, like these crab fossils, they're common. So you don't need to email the museum every time you find the same crab, but if you find a new one, that's probably good. And you don't, you never know, you might get something named after you, which happens quite often. And if you want to make paleontology a career, I recently chatted to 12 people that are working in paleontology and you don't have to go to university to work in paleontology. Um, so I never went to university to work in paleontology. As you heard, I'm a computer engineer. Uh, this is all just me messing around in the garage, you know, trying different things, finding things, uh, asking lots of questions. But yeah, some of these faces over here, you'll, 
you'll uh, probably recognize, they're in the room. Uh, so they're great people to ask about how do you get into paleontology if you want to go the traditional route where you go do a uh, combination of biology and geology, or if you want to, um, like some people, I'm just looking over here, like Keeley, she does amazing fossil preps of the Green River Formation in the States, and she, um, she was basically taught on the job, so she became an apprentice and just learned how to uh, prep fossils. So it's a, it's a really, it's a diverse hobby. When I, when I was looking out from the inside into paleontology, I thought everyone does the same job, but when you get to know a little bit more about the people, there's so many different things you can do in paleontology. So if you want to go have a look at that video, it's on my YouTube channel, it's about an hour and a half. There's a lot of good info in there. Uh, not from me, but from the professionals that I talked to in this video. Air scribes. <laughs> You've heard me talk about air scribes. So these are just some of the ways that I, I tackle these fossils. I'll go through them quickly. Uh, it starts at the big side over here, two-handed, very loud and noisy. And then this one over here, you use under a microscope. It's a very, very, um, very detailed work over there. And this is the main method. So most of these fossils I prepped using an air scribe. The crabs almost exclusively. And then the big ones over here. Oh, here's that thesis or vertebra. I think I forgot to show you, but there it is. Can I look at it afterwards? Most of the, the bones I actually use uh, an air scribe and then vinegar or acid at the end. Micro air abrasion is another method I use. So if you've ever used a sandblaster, this is just a very teeny tiny sandblaster. So we're using uh, some microns. And because we're in New Zealand, it's difficult to get hold of 100 micron dolomite. So what I do is I buy the dolomite at Bunnings in these big 50 kilogram bags. Then I sift it down to 100 microns, <laughs> which is very dusty, but it's great for the grass. So the grass grows really nicely underneath that. And you then put it in this little, uh, it's called a problast, and all it's doing is it's pushing air into the bottom over here, and then it comes out the nozzle and it shoots away the sediment on top of the crabs. I may, mainly use this for crabs because if you put a crab in vinegar, you don't have a crab at the end because they're the same, uh, the same as the rocks, so they also dissolve. And, you know, of course, I had to test that out, and I lost the crab like that, so <laughs> that's how it goes. Um, I talked about acid prepping a little bit. Uh, and this is the vinegar. I buy it in this 80%, which is really strong. So don't think you can put that, you know, on your chips and eat it. That's, you have to dilute it down to 5%. So you, you wear all the safety equipment with that. Uh, that's really bad stuff. <laughs> uh, so I fully kit up with gloves, respirator, eye goggles, all that. And all it's doing over here, so this looks really complex, but it's, it's not that complex. These little things over here are different types of stone, like there's feldspar, there's quartz, and that's what's in this concretion over here. So if you put this concretion over here under a microscope, it's actually lots of tiny little stones, and it's cemented together by something called calcite. Uh, calcite is calcium carbonate, if I've got it right. I think calcium carbonate, and what the vinegar does, it dissolves the calcium carbonate, which is the cement, and all those little bits just fall away. And then you're left with something like this. And this is a close-up of this turtle skull. And you can see these little holes in there. It's actually cleaned out those holes. So all the sediments come out there. And you can see the suture lines over there. And <laughs> um, so what's today? Thursday. Monday, I get the keys to a workshop. <laughs> uh, so I've been doing all this in one half of my garage. <laughs> uh, so it's really noisy, it's really dusty, it's really cramped, and finally I've run out of space, and this workshop near my house was uh, for lease. So I've signed a one-year lease, and I'm paying for this with my YouTube. <laughs> uh, you know, the bit I get from YouTube, and also, you know, the help of my patrons. Some of you are in the audience, so thanks for that. And that's what I'm going to do. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start displaying my fossils, because at the moment these fossils are all in cabinets in my garage. No one can enjoy them. So I'm going to put them up for display there, and I'll have a workshop where people can come see the fossils from the area in the area. And that's, yeah, <laughs> it's scary, but it's also exciting. <laughs> and yeah, I think I'm pretty much on time, but 
one of my current projects. So I've gone back to university to study paleontology, so I'm back at second year uh, with all the 20 year olds and <laughs> doing biology and paleontology. And if my lecturer is watching, uh, this is why I missed the lab today. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I got a sternly worded email about missing the lab. But yeah, for, for a good cause. Um, I've also just recently found this tooth bird fossil. So if you didn't know, some birds had teeth. Uh, it's probably the closest thing to a dinosaur I've found. That's a pelagonithid. Uh, you get a pelagornis. Anyone want to take a guess at the wingspan of this? bird, maybe not the specific one I found, but here it is. This is a 3D model of the beak. Ah, oh, sorry, it goes like that, that's the top. <laughs> so that's the top of the beak, and you can see these, these aren't real teeth, they're bony teeth, so it's part of the, the beak. Who wants to guess at the wingspan? Any guesses? How, how big would it be if it stretched out its wings? Four meters, let's go higher. Yeah? Five meters, go a little bit higher? Ten. Not quite 10. <laughs> 5.7 meters, so if it spread out its wings, uh, this one, Chiliensis, would have been about 5.7 meters. It's either Chiliensis or the other one, but it's a, it's a pelagonithid. And that's the biggest bird that's ever lived. So really, really big bird. Would have stolen all your chips if it swooped down. <laughs> that's something I've just recently found. So if you go look at my uh, YouTube channel, there's one where I've just found that. I found just the only thing that was sticking out of the rock was that. So just this little bit, and I looked at it, I'm like, that looks like teeth over there, but bony teeth, so I was quite excited. It was a stormy, rainy day. I thought I'd be out there five minutes, and that's it, and I found that one thing in five minutes. And what's quite cool with the one I found, it's got the brain case, so we can CT scan it and see what its brain looked like. And someone very clever will probably tell you what his thoughts were, <laughs> but, or how it thought. <laughs> uh, the other thing I'm working on is this bullfish skull. So if you're not sure what a bullfish is, think marlin. So that's a, a marlin skull I found about four years ago. That's in Australia at the moment at the nuclear reactor. They're gonna scan it using uh, neutrons instead of x-rays, because x-rays didn't penetrate it, it was too dense. And then I still need to work on my uh, turtle skull over there. And of course, um, you know, I didn't learn all this myself. Uh, so a huge thank you to so many people that have helped me, all the questions I've asked. Uh, they've been really good with answering uh, the random emails I send where I just send a photo of something sticking out of a rock. I'm like, hey, did I find something good? <laughs> or should I just, you know, leave it there? One of the things, uh, one of the earliest things I found was a, a whale skull about this big. And I found it on, on the beach, and of course it would be at the bottom of a big cliff. So I had to make a wagon, go down, put it on the wagon. It took me four hours to get it back up the cliff, and it's now in Te Papa in the storeroom. I saw it again there today. Um, if you want to go look at some really good New Zealand geology videos, go look at Out There Learning. We've got Julian over here in the front. Put up your hand there, Julian. They can come talk to you afterwards. Julian's got some really good uh, geology and paleontology content on YouTube very good videos. We often watch them at our uh, Geology Rock Club. And if you want to ask me any questions, I'm on most of the social medias. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I'm, I'm still haven't figured out TikTok quite, but yeah, I'm on there. <laughs> uh, and I've got some frequently asked questions on my link tree. So if you go to that link tree, Mam Lambo fossils, what I've done is I've put some, uh, some links to the things, some questions I get asked like, how do crabs get in the rock? There's a video on that. <laughs> See if you still, uh, and do I sell any fossils? No, I don't, that's a short answer, but yeah, you can download my 3D models and print your own if you want to. And that's pretty much it. I think, I think we're on time, but we've probably got time for questions. Yes. I've got three. Yes, let's go. Did you take this down in the stuff? Uh, no, I found the first time it's been in New Zealand. Oh. So. Yes. Yeah, so, no, no, not that one. No, no. So it's a new species for New Zealand, the Hubbalai. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, I'm getting nods. Yeah. Okay. How many have you found that have stood up and in the rock? 
Oh, yeah. Uh, I would say my first three months, 90% of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, nothing in it. Um, one of the first big things I carried home, oh, it was a hot summer's day, hot for New Zealand, 32 degrees, which is a scorcher. And I carried this big boulder on my shoulders past the farmer shaking his head at me, got to home, took some photos, sent it to the museum. They're like, ah, it's a trace fossil, which is not the words you want to hear. Trace fossil is, it's probably not anything good. <laughs> Yeah, so a trace fossil is just like a barnacle lived here and now it's been infilled or something else kind of thing. Hmm, good one. <laughs> the, one of the, the cool things I heard was when the last pyramid was built, there were Egyptologists there studying the earliest pyramid. So that's how old the pyramids are, that the, the later, yeah, oh yeah, the, the crazier the theory is, the more I'm on board. <laughs> I do like a good crazy theory where the, no, I think just a lot of people, you know, working very slowly over millennia, probably my bet, but I'd love it to be aliens. <laughs> definitely not in my wheelhouse, but I know they've done some studies, and this is me talking about something I have no experience with, where they look at how the rocks have weathered. So they've taken a, yeah, like the sandstone, you know sandstone weathers at a rate that you could probably. Yeah, yeah. but I love a good conspiracy theory. <laughs> Any other questions? There's no questions, I've got another, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, good question. <laughs> I was just asking how your family feels about your hobby and the time you spend on it. Yeah, how do you feel? They're in the room, so we can ask them. <laughs> Amber, do you enjoy it? Was that a, I think she went like this. <laughs> It's nice to see all the things firsthand. It's probably not so nice having dusty footprints all over the house or when I use the, the oven um, to bake some of my fossils. <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of the kitchen utensils go missing because I've used them and made them full of, uh, you know, vinegar. <laughs> okay, there's one, one more video, a bonus video. Oh, yeah? Yes. The favorite fossil, it's, it's tricky because I love this penguin. For the longest time, I looked for a penguin. I'm not, you know, since I heard there were penguins to be found, and New Zealand's kind of known as the place where penguins came from, evolved, um, I wanted to find a penguin. So when I found this penguin, I just couldn't believe my eyes, and I was so excited. So I love this penguin, and so it's got a really safe place. It lives in Te Papa now, this penguin. And then I found this. <laughs> which is also just such a really cool fossil. I don't know, there's something about looking into its eyes when it's just looking at you and trying to picture what, it's, what it saw when it was, you know, came up for air and those kind of things. So I really love this because it's so charismatic. It's kind of like it's got a personality, this one. But then I found the beaked, uh, well, the toothed bird. And I'm like, oh, that's also a cool one. So I think those three are my top three ones, those. And hopefully when I find an actual dinosaur in New Zealand, that'll be my favorite one. <laughs> Who knows why we don't find dinosaurs in New Zealand, really? Who's got, who knows? Anyone over here? I don't know the answer, so I'm asking. <laughs> Where should I go look? That's one of my missions this year, to try and find an actual dinosaur. Hawke's Bay. Yeah, that's a, yeah. If it was on the main island, I'd go there more. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm based in Christchurch. I don't know if I said that at the beginning. Here's a bonus video. Uh, who wants to take a guess at what this is? So this, this is where I normally find the crabs. So this is a place in North Canterbury where I find these crabs. And I flipped this rock over, and I saw these little bits sticking out, and they've kind of got crystals in them over there. 
So that kind of tells you that the bones are hollow because there's crystals growing inside it. And who knows what's got hollow bones? Yeah. Birds, yeah. Did you also want to say bird? Yes. <laughs> so this is a bird bone. And what's cool about this is it's not a penguin. So you'd expect to find penguins, you know, these are all deep water ocean deposits, so you'd expect to find penguins there. But this was a flying bird. It had hollow bones. So penguins don't have hollow bones because they, they dive a lot. Otherwise, they'd you know, come up to the surface. Uh, so yeah, this was a, a hollow bone. So I was pretty excited about this. Uh, but it was only one half of a concretion. Right, let me play the video. So this was only one half of a concretion. So these concretions we find are normally spherical. So if you see them at uh, Muraki boulders, you know the Muraki boulders? That's a concretion. So this was one half of a concretion, and it had these beautiful bird bones sticking out. I thought it was a weird crab at first, but luckily someone else in the group said, no, it's, it's bird bones. You should take it back home. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so when I flipped it over, this was when I was starting out. I was like, oh, what happened to this crab? You know, how am I going to prep that? But yeah, luckily we, we saw that. You can see the calcite crystals just over there. And yeah, it's from a, a sheer water that we think, or an albatross, or a tiny albatross. And then I kept going back looking for the other half, didn't find it. And this is the, that same half that's been prepped by Al Man Mannering. He's an expert prepper from Christchurch. So he prepped all those bones out because bird bones are so fragile. If you do one wrong move, they kind of just explode because they're hollow. So there's all sorts of cool bits of bone in there, but it's missing the skull. So if you, if you don't know, skulls are good to find because you can tell more about the bird or you can tell a lot about the bird. There's the wishbone, the furcula over there. So nine months later, so I, I've been going back to the site in those nine months, like every weekend. This is the other half. You can see it fits perfectly you know, in there. And that's, that's the skull over there. That's a, a bit of the bird skull just sticking out there. Uh, yeah, when I first found it, I didn't realize it was the, the other half because it had been so long. But yeah, then after, after a while, I, I looked at my phone, actually at the photos of the other one, I realized, ah, this is the other half. So you can see how they match up, those two. And there it is. There's the skull. So yeah, you have to be really persistent because for nine months, it just didn't appear. And then one day, it was just over there. Yeah. Uh, mm. Yeah. There's there's some bones that are more diagnostic than others, so you might find a random piece of rib that long, and you probably won't be able to tell much from it. But if you found you know, the bottom of a leg bone, and you just find that bit, that can tell you probably if it's a penguin, or if it's an albatross, all sorts of things. Yes. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's where Te Papa and other museums' uh, collections are really important, because they can go to the bird leg bone drawer, pull it open, and compare it until they find something that's the closest to it. And sometimes there's nothing very close to it, and that could mean it's a new species. So they call it, I think, comparative collections. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting some nods. Oh, there's various methods. Uh, so carbon-14 doesn't work anything older than 50,000 years. So microfossils sometimes, so in the concretion over here. I mentioned earlier there's other fossils in there. So sometimes you get these single-celled forams in there and you can use them to date it quite accurately. There's also strontium levels and all sorts of other things you can use. Anything else? Yes. Yes, where? Yeah, maybe there weren't a lot of dinosaurs in New Zealand. We just have to find where they congregated. It's a good answer to that question, thanks. But yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, thanks, Poppy, for letting me talk to everyone. It was awesome. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>
I uh, just wanted to say thank you all for coming and another big thank you to Mornay for sharing um, your passion for fossils with us and a special thank you to our New Zealand Sign Language interpreters um, for their wonderful work tonight. Thank you. And Mornay has said you're welcome to come up and have a closer look if you like.